the destroyer of worlds. The ancient writing of the Mahabharata describes what many experts theorize could have been some kind of nuclear attack on a prehistoric people. It speaks of ancient flying machines that had the power to hurl projectiles at the earth called Vimanas. Historical documents show that the information given on the Vimana was actually quite mechanical and technical and were said to be able to move in any direction and capable of traveling across air, ground, sea and even through space. With the help of the machines, human beings could fly in the air and could transport heavenly beings down to the earth. Its travel was charted using words that our modern science can liken to our current measurement of light years. It was capable of bringing swift destruction. Now I am become death. Dr. J. Robert Oppenheimer himself is rumored to have believed that his atomic bomb was not the first the world had seen. One such example is the mysterious necklace found in King Tut's tomb. It was glass, and not just any glass, but glass derived from an enigmatic source. After much testing, astrochemists said that the material had been created at temperatures so high that it could only have been formed by a meteor colliding with Earth except there was virtually no evidence of any meteors or asteroid impacts. When the first atomic bomb was tested in 1945 in New Mexico, it left a thin layer of similar glass across the desert sand. However, the area of glass in the Egyptian desert is vastly bigger. Whatever happened in Egypt must have been more powerful than an atomic bomb and the stone in Tut's necklace is a souvenir of that explosion. This type of glass is found throughout various deserts in the world and are known as seas of glass. A meteor seems the most feasible explanation until one considers the lack of impact evidence on these places of the earth. But even more fascinating, the moon has at least one sea of glass on it as well. The moon is covered in scars and craters, indicative of explosions either at or near its surface, creating what appeared to be mountain ranges similar to Earth's, which also show that the moon has undergone trauma probably near the same time that Earth saw hers. In Rajasthan, India, a new living community was built over a three square mile area. Once people started moving in, however, they started getting suspiciously ill. The area was evacuated and the government restricted access to the vicinity. It was discovered that there were inexplicably high radiation levels in a circular shape over the ground with no point of impact. This pattern is characteristic of a fair burst nuclear discharge. What they found at nearby Harappa and Mahanyodaro really blew their minds. Under the earth was evidence of what appeared to be a nuclear blast dating back between 8,000 and 12,000 years. Archaeologist Francis Taylor said, It's so mind-boggling to imagine that some civilization had nuclear technology before we did. The radioactive ash adds credibility to the ancient Indian records that describe atomic warfare. The evidence for such activity is located worldwide in the KT boundary layer of ash and clay that covers the earth on each and every continent and deep beneath the surface. And within this ash and clay are a preponderance of tektites, shocked quartz, and or glassy globules of fused sand or dirt, the kind of which are produced by the intense heat of either a meteor strike or a nuclear detonation. And many of them are slightly radioactive still. This layer also contains a large amount of the extremely rare and prohibitive iridium. So how did the Earth get a substantial layer of it worldwide that far beneath the surface? 
There are two possible answers to this question. The first is ventured by Frederick Soddy, a former professor of chemistry, physicist, author and expert in radioactive elements, matter and energy. On this matter, he stated, I believe that there have been civilizations in the past that were familiar with atomic energy, and by misusing it, they were totally destroyed. Beyond this, the mysteries surrounding this topic go much further than the Earth. Roche limit is the distance within which a celestial body held together by its own gravity will disintegrate due to a second celestial body's tidal forces exceeding the first body's gravitational self-attraction. Bode's law is a hypothesis that states that the bodies in some orbital systems, including the suns, orbit at semi-major axis in a function of planetary sequence. The formula suggests that extending outward, each planet would be approximately twice as far from the sun as the previous planet. The equation applies to our own solar system nearly perfectly and helped locate Uranus and the planetoid series. However, there is one place in this planetary system where the equation should work, but it doesn't. According to Bode, there should be a planet between Mars and Jupiter. Instead, what we find is an asteroid debris field, dubbed the Asteroid Belt. Proof of a destroyed planet is everywhere throughout our solar system, from the scouring of the surfaces of celestial bodies to the rings on planets. It is manifest in the fact that astral bodies showing signs of ancient vegetation and civilization are now deserted and incapable of habitation. Further evidence in our solar system can be found with comets, as C.K. Quarterman illustrates. Comets provide the most convincing argument in favor of a destroyed planet. Comets cannot date back to the beginning of the solar system because they consist of evolved matter, such as water, which cannot form in the void of space. Water can only form on the surface of a planet with an atmosphere. We live in a solar system that should have ten planets. The asteroid belt mentioned before is all that is left of this destroyed world. Could it be that both comets and meteors within our solar system originated from the same place? Could it be that the asteroids and dust that remain in the asteroid belt are the leftovers of a violent collision that pulverized a shiny iridium-based planet? The answer to how the Earth got a substantial worldwide layer of iridium beneath its surface might be found in the Bible. However, first we must look at what the heavy bombardment period was and what were the results. According to the BBC, the late heavy bombardment is an event thought to have occurred approximately 4.1 to 3.8 billion years ago, at a time corresponding to the Neohadian and Eorchian areas on Earth. During this interval, a disproportionate number of asteroids are theorized to have collided with the early terrestrial planets in the inner solar system, including Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. The LHB happened after the Earth and other rocky planets had formed and accreted most of their mass, but still quite early in Earth's history. Evidence for the LHB derives from lunar samples brought back by the Apollo astronauts. There is ample evidence to suggest it was this cosmic rock storm that deposited iridium throughout the planet. Therefore, for the sake of discussion, let's assume that it was these multiple asteroid impacts, all at the same time, that deposited the iridium in the KT layer. If we do, then it appears likely that the source of those impacts can be tied directly to something called Rahab, as read in Job 26, 11 and 12. The pillars of heaven tremble and are astonished at his reproof. He divideth the sea with his power, and by his understanding he smiteth through the proud. God absolutely shattered it, as Psalm 89.10 says, Thou hast broken Rahab in pieces, as one that is slain. Thou hast scattered thine enemies with thy strong arm. Rahab is not simple pride, as translated in the King James translation of Job 26.11, but appears to have been a place from where God scattered his enemies. Rahab comes into focus with Isaiah 51.9. 
awake, awake, put on strength. O arm of the Lord, awake, as in the ancient days, in the generations of old. Art thou not it that hath cut Rahab, and wounded the dragon? The book of Isaiah was written somewhere between 760 and 700 B.C. The verses referring to as in ancient days and generations of old. The word ancient days is from the Hebrew, kedem, and literally means earliest times. Generations of old is our word alam, again, which can mean antiquity, but can also mean ages or eternity. Consider that the oldest patriarch of Israel, Abraham, lived during the Isin Babylonian dynasty. Are we to believe that Isaiah is referring to a thousand years in the past as being ancient days or ages? Or is he speaking of a time even before Abraham? Adam would have been created nearly 3,000 years before Isaiah was born. So the prophet could have been referring to this time frame. However, there is no account in scripture during either Abraham or Adam's time of a Rahab being cut. Therefore, one can only assume that Isaiah is referring to another time. Since Adam was the beginning of mankind, it must have been a time before that. And third, the verse says that God wounded the dragon. There is another important descriptor for the dragon in Revelation 12:9. It is none other than Satan himself. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. It appears that this verse is speaking about an ancient time, even before Adam and Eve, a pre-Adamic era, when God wounded Satan and scattered those that were with him. If so, where was this place called Rahab that was cut or shattered or, as one version translates, Job 26.11, pulverized by God's rebuke? This judgment of the dragon would reach earth because God purposed it as a witness to others. This is the message of Ezekiel 28.18. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic. Therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee. It shall devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. What were the ashes that rained down on the earth for all to see? Perhaps they were the fragments of a planet that no longer exists. If so, then we can surmise that the place God destroyed because of the rebellious dragon and his followers was none other than the original fifth planet from the sun, Rahab. Just as an expert chess player sacrifices a piece to protect the queen, the solar system may have given up a giant planet and spared the earth. Rahab meant boaster or pride and was the home of Satan and the fallen angels and known to be the stone of fire. Remember that the Vimanas were said to bring the heavenly beings down to Earth. These interplanetary vehicles surely played a large role in the fallen angel's interaction with mankind, and since Rahab was a planet probably able to sustain life, people may have been taken up to the planet as well. Prior to Rahab's destruction, the angels who had left their first estate also used stargates to get off the planet and make their home in other parts of the solar system. This planet's destruction was so thorough that the angelic civilization on Mars was also destroyed. The fallout spread across the solar system, including Earth, which was bombarded with asteroids in an extinction-level event. This barrage not only killed the dinosaurs, but also erased the angelic pre-Adamic civilization that existed on this planet. Such destruction wrought on Rahab and the solar system should give every 21st century human pause and cause them to ponder if this kind of terror could be revisited upon the solar system and Earth in the future. The answer to that question would be a sorrowful yes. It happens at least once every 3600 years according to the Sumerians, and we are due. And this shall be the plague wherewith the Lord will smite all the people that have fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall consume away while they stand upon their feet. 
and their eyes shall consume away in their holes, and their tongue shall consume away in their mouth. And it shall come to pass in that day that a great tumult from the Lord shall be among them, and they shall lay hold every one on the hand of his neighbor, 